Hello, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to Women in Space, presented by the Truman Center. I'm Marina Corrin. I'm a staff writer at The Atlantic, where I cover space exploration. And I'm glad to be here today in conversation with Leticia Garriott de Caillou and Kelly Girardi. Uh, despite what the name of this event suggests, we are not actually in space right now, but I think that we're going to have a really great discussion. So let me start by introducing Leticia and Kelly. Leticia Garriott de Caillou is the founder and CEO of Global Space Ventures. She serves on the board of directors of XPRIZE, which launched the $100 million carbon removal XPRIZE with Elon Musk. She is also a security fellow of the Truman National Security Project and an advisory board member of the Truman Center. Leticia, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Marina. Kelly is in, a, in global mission operations at Palantir Technologies and has flown multiple parabolic research campaigns to evaluate spacesuits and conduct research in microgravity. She is a science communicator whose work has reached, has reached hundreds of thousands of people on social media. She also serves on the Defense Council for the Truman National Security Project. Kelly, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I'd like to kick our chat off today with some recent news in the space world, the Inspiration4 mission. So last week, SpaceX launched its first private astronauts into orbit and then brought them back home three days later. Um, I was there on the ground at Kennedy Space Center watching this and it felt really different. This was not a NASA-led mission. Uh, I'm curious whether you followed the mission and what you think about it. Yeah, you want to go first, uh, Leticia? Uh, ha happy to go. Uh, so I, I think, you know, I, I followed the mission. I wasn't on the ground as a crew departed, but I had a chance to meet them prior. And for me, I think what was really uh, special and important about this mission is that, as you said, it was the first a fully private mission to orbit. And why that's important is because it really represents the change we're seeing from uh, what has been government dominated access to space to commercially dominated access to space. And while it's easy uh, for people to label this as a billionaire's joyride, uh, that's really not what it's about. Uh, if you think about Columbus sailing uh, across the ocean, sponsored by Spain, and how it was followed by the British East India Company and how trade and commerce started from there, uh, we are really seeing something similar here where uh, it's an important step in unleashing the outsized returns that space can provide to Earth and, and sort of the advent of those uh, privately sponsored efforts uh, to make this happen. So I think that's really exciting. And then since this is a women in space panel, I have to mention that uh, it was obviously uh, amazing to see that half the crew was women, uh, incredibly encouraging to see the first black female pilot uh, make it to orbit, uh, the first but not the last. And, uh, and I'm just excited to see how uh, there are so many efforts uh, happening right now to make sure space is inclusive. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I think Leticia nailed the economic, you know, potential and benefits that are going to come from increased access to orbit like this and to space. And maybe then I'll, I'll touch on the more personal side, you know, as, as a civilian myself who's going to be going to space in the near future, flying with Virgin Galactic as a payload specialist, you know, the, the quick bluff for me on inspiration for, for her was that this is like the biggest limiting factor to becoming an astronaut has always been access, not aptitude. And this proved that this crew of four, they trained in months to go to orbit and it could have been weeks if they had consolidated that training schedule down to just, you know, beginning to end in one, in one go. And so I think with access increasing, it's proving that anyone can, can become an astronaut and go to space if they're given the opportunity to train and fly. And it's kind of a reminder that even our favorite NASA astronauts were once sort of civilians before government sponsored training. And I don't think that takes anything away, of course, from the incredible accomplishments of NASA astronauts. I think limited access to opportunity has led to extraordinary talent selection from the government pool. But NASA also screens for different medical criteria and mission specific SME experience, right? 
And so I think what industry can do is really broaden the selection criteria towards this goal of increasing humanity's footprint in space and increasing access to space, which to Leticia's point is, you know, sort of expanding Earth's economic sphere at the same time. So it was awesome. I also happened to have friends on board that mission. So it was just very emotional to watch them leave this planet and to come back with, you know, all of the celebration that was so well deserved. And it's, you know, this is a new space age. So it's really exciting to watch that momentum. Yeah, there's always a moment during a rocket launch, at least for me, when I realize well, I'm looking at it and it looks amazing, especially a night launch. And then I realize, oh, there's people sitting on top of that rocket. It's quite the moment. Um, so Kelly, I, I wanna ask you about that Virgin Galactic flight. Um, obviously everyone saw Richard Branson pull that off this summer, um, but it, it, you know, in the, couple, in the weeks since, we've kind of learned that that flight was maybe a little bit more dangerous than it might have seemed. And I'm curious how you're feeling about your own trip and, and what you want to get out of it. Yeah, totally. So, you know, first, I'm not sure that I would consider it like more dangerous than it might have seemed. I, I don't think, you know, personally, the way I view it is like, you know, space flight comes with inherent risk. I think, you know, that flight itself was monumental opportunity for me. I had the privilege to co-host the global live stream and be there on the ground, you know, with my mom and my daughter, which was which was so special for them to get to see, you know, the spaceship that I will be flying on in the not too distant future. But, you know, part of my passion for joining this industry a decade ago now was really to help and accelerate the efforts of companies like Virgin Galactic in opening up this access to space. And so I've had the benefit of seeing the full range of the industry, years with the Commercial Space Flight Federation, you know, contributing to the creation of the regulatory framework and the launch licensing process that, you know, we're, we're talking about today. And this is what it looks like to open a new frontier and sort of push the envelope of civilian spaceflight. And I think that like one other thing I would note for me personally, speaking very personally, just to share that to me, you know, this isn't just a faceless company to me when I think about them. These are my friends, some of my best friends in the world, Richard Branson, of course, uh, Sir Richard had, you know, the most headlines from that flight, but one of my best friends in the world, Sarisha Banlow, was also on board that Unity 22 flight. You know, these, these are um, folks who are former industry colleagues working there, fellow space evangelists, who I know share the same goal as I do of opening up access to space to a broader slice of humanity. So, you know, I, I think the other thing that I, I take into consideration here is their engineers, you know, they're, um, so the question is like, if I, if the question is, would I put my life in their hands? It's like an unequivocal yes. I, I'm grateful for the privilege to do so. And I have full confidence in the pilots, the engineers, and the team on the ground at MCC. So I'm, I'm excited and I'm ready to fly. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Excited for you. Um, Leticia, I'm curious how uh, you got into this business and what inspired you to, to work in this sphere? Uh, so, uh, I mean, like Kelly has had this dream of space flight. I think it's very clear from hearing her uh, forever, and I'm so glad she's pursuing it uh, with such grit. Uh, uh, in my case, I had a dream of space camp as a kid, uh, and one day space, um, at, my family couldn't afford it. Uh, I grew up in France where uh, girls didn't really go to engineer school. Uh, there was no female astronaut in France until I became an adult. So I really grew up, uh, you know, uh, in, in a place where it wasn't really what girls did. And, uh, you know, it's not that it, sh it shouldn't have stopped me in any way. I actually developed very early on an interest in frontier technology. So broader than just space, uh, I focused my early career in finance and frontier technology. And when I came to the US, uh, that was uh, in the early 2000 uh, to do my MBA at Harvard and the space industry was just getting started. So uh, Elon had just started SpaceX. And what was really the turning point for me was much later. It was uh, when Falcon 9 had its maiden launch. So we're now around 2010. Uh, and because what that did is it really uh, it was that realization that uh, we could now unleash the return of space for humanity. It was making it tangible. It was now within reach. And so what, what was for me an interest uh, for space camp and going to space one day as a kid really morphed into, well, I'm a business person. How can I help? How can I contribute uh, to uh, 
to this industry. Uh, and so ever since I've been active as an entrepreneur and as an investor in the space, I invested early in SpaceX. I joined Escape Dynamics um, as co-founder president to develop advanced beamed energy propulsion technology for space launch. Uh, I've made more investment uh, in space technology and emerging technology more broadly. Uh, and I serve on the board of NATO's and Man Maritime System Innovation Advisory Board, where there is obviously a big space component because it's sort of multi-domain uh, uh, there. And, and on the board of XPRIZE, uh, which was really uh, a key enabler in that industry taking shape, and I think will continue through its prize competition to really push those technologies uh, in places where uh, the incentives are not fully there yet. Uh, so that's that's sort of what has been my path uh, into into uh, being active in space. So would you fly on with Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin, or SpaceX? Uh, so I, uh, I I'm really interested in in being an enabler more than flying myself. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, what motivates me is really impact at scale for the benefit of humanity. And that's something that exponential technologies uh, make this possible uh, because they're so scalable. And, uh, and space becoming uh, an arena where, where we're able to also unleash those, those returns, you know, whether it's, we're all very familiar with GPS and space, uh, you know, weather satellites and things like that, but people are less familiar with other technologies like uh, space-based uh, uh, cell towers, for example. So uh, one of the uh, portfolio companies I'm invested in, Link, just signed their two first MNO customers, uh, one in Africa, one in the Bahamas, to allow a cell service, like to sell to, to, to mobile phone to communicate with each other through space uh, when mobile networks are down. Uh, which is very helpful in all kinds of situation. You can imagine in Africa where there is not such cell tower density, uh, you're often in regions where you have absolutely no connectivity or when you're at sea and you have no connectivity while well, being able with your simple handset to communicate is something that can be life savings. Uh, and so uh, there are all those sort of benefits to humanity that are so monumental that I want to be here and be a part of this and make it happen. And that ties back to national security uh, because the same exponential technologies that are the ones that will uh, uh, doom us uh, if, you know, if we don't uh, fight to stay uh, in the lead or through which we will stand strong and we will protect our democracies. And so uh, I, that's, that's sort of what gets me going. Right. Kelly, I want to ask you about your um, science communication on TikTok, um, which I'm afraid to get because I, I will get sucked into all of the cat videos and never leave, but um, obviously a huge platform. And I'm curious what kind of response you get from the people that you reach. Because for me, I come from a generation of, uh, you know, teachers wheeling in TVs into classrooms to watch the, the shuttle take off. And now the space flight landscape is ex extremely different. And the people on TikTok are also, you know, have a different understanding of American space flight. And I'm curious what messages you want to get across to them and what you get back from them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, social media has been such a powerful platform for, for me to reach people. And the key audience that I'm trying to reach is non-space people, sort of breaking out of the echo chamber of, you know, the space industry and, and reaching people to Leticia's point who, who may not see like the tangible like benefits or even how space relates to their everyday life. And I think for me in particular, really trying to showcase that this isn't just, you know, a dream for only extraordinary humans who are sort of like predestined to be on this path, but it is something that is increasingly accessible. You know, I think one of the most incredible parts about my own opportunity to fly to space is the fact that my three-year-old's daughter just thinks that flying to space is something mommies do. I mean, in her little framework, she really is growing up thinking like it's a little more odd that a daddy would go to space than a mommy. And so that's like, you know, I'm very pleased <laughs> about that. But at the same time, it's like that normalcy and sort of that, you know, um, challenge to the framework is something that I really want to put out there in, in my content and, and normalizing it and saturating, you know, the spaces that I occupy with more space content. So I've tried to take as many people along for the ride. 
so to speak, as possible. And I think that's, you know, one of my chief goals is making space relatable, making it accessible, and making clear that this is not just in the realm of the, you know, um, either uh, government only astronauts or just incredibly wealthy that we are opening up access to space for all different disciplines to use space as really a laboratory to benefit humanity which i i think you know these these upcoming flights especially science dedicated science missions like the one that i'll be taking part on really have the opportunity to to push forward so yeah i love tiktok addicted to it you know for all of my Truman folks, please know I use a burner phone and a separate device to download TikTok. I, but um, it's it's like, you know, it's a really fun way to engage on a topic that I'm super passionate about. And so I, I've enjoyed using social media to, to that benefit and goal. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, Leticia, I'm curious how, how you go about deciding what companies right now are the most interesting to you and the ones worth investing in? And, you know, beyond, you know, satellite technology that could benefit underserved communities, like, I wonder if, if this new era of commercial space flight with private astronauts going up pretty regularly is going to create a new infrastructure, you know, like, it's a customer experience now, what companies are going to crop up around that? Um, I'm curious what you think the next, you know, five to 10 look, years look like and where you want to kind of, you know, dig in. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, it's an expanding frontier of interest at the intersection of where the biggest needs and challenges are, and where there are solutions that are viable and thus scalable. Uh, so I'll speak to four sectors. Uh, the first, uh, which was really the key challenge that we're solving is cheap access to space. It's a holy grail, it enables everything else. And so that's the launch segment where SpaceX is de facto, you know, the, the leader uh, and others are trying to break in. Um, the second one is connectivity, uh, which I think, you know, connectivity for all uh, everywhere uh, solves so many issues. It lifts uh, hundreds of millions out of poverty. It allows, uh, to deal with uh, disaster management uh, where you save, uh, again, uh, millions of lives. And so that's what uh, uh, communi uh, broadband uh, satellite communication like SpaceX uh, or a company like Link, which I was describing that is doing space-based uh, uh, cell towers uh, are enabling. Uh, they will allow us to bridge the connectivity gap uh, for rural America and, and beyond in developing nations. And, and that to, to me is truly exciting. Uh, a third uh, category uh, is everything that has to do with space and drone data. Uh, so I, I think there, you know, with synthetic aperture radar, uh, uh, all the technologies that are being developed, we are we're getting really great data with a, a million use cases. And so that's where a lot of the action is going to be. Uh, and then the fourth, uh, I just want to point, for example, at a challenge that is not unsolvable, but uh, that is difficult to solve, which is orbital debris. Uh, because that's one where it might be too early. And I know there are already private companies pursuing it as a commercial effort, but it's one where we haven't really figured it yet. It's not yet obvious what the right technology is. It, you know, are you going to use a laser to beam uh, something uh, uh, to beam on something so that you can decrease its orbital velocity that will make it re-enter ultimately? Like, what is the proper technology? And so, that's an area where it might be too early for commercial to take over, right? And so, we, for example, the X Prize. Uh, we are discussing right now with Space Force and exploring with them whether we should have a, an express on orbital debris to, to incent and push development of technology in that field so we can all look and see what, what is the right technology going forward, you know, uh, so that we can solve this big challenge that, that's shared with so many, uh, uh, so many others. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, that's, again, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a fluid, uh, frontier of expanding interest, but that's sort of how I would categorize it. And can, can you expand a little bit on the, the topic of orbital debris and why that's a concern for, 
for us moving forward as more people, you know, start launching more objects into space and, and really using it as a, as a place of business. Yeah, so uh, orbital debris is a, is a concern uh, because of uh, something called the Kessler effect in particular, which essentially when you have a collision, you know, with a certain density, it can lead to more and more collision. And so what we want to avoid is an Armageddon type event in space. Uh, there are also orbital debris in situation where you might have a, a voluntary uh, destruction of a space asset by an adversary, which would trigger orbital debris. And so what do you do also in that situation? So uh, it, it is uh, space constellation are bringing a lot of new spacecraft in this orbit. And we're less concerned about what's below 600 kilometers because at this altitude, a satellite will naturally deorbit and burn upon re-entry. But anything that's above that and that's on orbit. And if you lose uh, communication with the satellite and they don't have the capability to deorbit by themselves, uh, you know, it can be an issue. Uh, so uh, so this is something you wanna manage. You wanna know that there is a, a, a plan to, uh, that, that there's a capability to, to remove anything you wanna remove uh, from space. And what we're missing at the current time uh, in particular is we don't have analytical tools to really assess in an independent fashion uh, the risk that uh, some of the proposed constellation are bringing uh, to the overall space environments. Uh, and so uh, developing these tools, for example, is something that will be really critical uh, because there will need to be a constant reevaluation. Uh, obviously, you know, the first one that, that a, a certain probability of risk might be tolerable at a point in time, but as the environment becomes more densely populated, the same risk might no longer be tolerable and we might need to have an adjustment, right? So, uh, so all this will need to be built so that on a, on a constant basis, we have a clear picture of what the risks are and, and, uh, and commercial entities uh, can be held accountable for, uh, for ensuring uh, the safety of our space environment. And I want to touch on something, Leticia, you mentioned earlier, the question of space billionaires. Um, you know, Branson, Bezos, Musk, they're doing some of the most interesting things in space exploration right now. Um, the, the satellite constellations you just talked about, I've lost track of how many SpaceX has already launched and Amazon wants to do the same. And, uh, you know, SpaceX and Blue Origin are kind of jostling over who gets to provide landing technology on the moon for NASA. You know, these are people that are really shaping the future of American spaceflight in many ways. And at the same time, they're very complicated public figures. And I'm curious how you, as people inside the industry, approach this discussion and what you'd want someone to know, you know, who who just you know, you sees the billionaire aspect of it and has certain certain um, opinions about these people. Yeah, um, you know, the, the way I view it is that exploration and innovation has always relied on both patrons and pioneers. In some cases, this is the same person. <laughs> um, and I view private investment in space as really essential to expanding Earth's economic sphere and, you know, ensuring that we have this robust and stable commercial industry that can continue to provide extraordinary partnership to the government sector and to continue to increase opportunities for individuals as well. I think the stability and robustness of a viable um, commercial sector is really critical and, and important and one that you know we've reaped great benefit from on the government side as well. And that I, I think like doubling down on the public private partnerships of the future are gonna enable us to benefit from the operational tempo and agility of the private sector with the deep institutional expertise and knowledge of the government sector. And like that together unlocks the velocity that you know opens the next chapter and, and more opportunity. So that, that's sort of how I view that dynamic in a nutshell. Yeah, I, I think Kelly nailed it. Um, and uh, I would add that I, I think, you know, it's the, the headline are about the billionaires and so on, but uh, there are tons of entrepreneurs uh, in space and, and in frontier technologies in general uh, that are developing, uh, you know, AI technology for the future of aerial mobility, for example, they, they're not billionaires, so they, they get less into the headline, but the work they're doing is just as important 
Uh, and I think public-private partnership uh, is really uh, the way forward uh, in terms of ensuring we don't stifle innovation, we save uh, American taxpayers uh, everything we can because uh, uh, you know, it's, it's really important the government works with the private sector in a way that it doesn't uh, choose the winners. Uh, uh, it, uh, it, you know, we, uh, it needs to remain a competitive process. So, uh, but, uh, but if we do it well, uh, there is no other path uh, than relying on commercial space and the private sector to ensure innovation and, and, and progress uh, uh, will be achieved. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I'd like to, to jump back to the, the title of this event, Women in Space. Um, the space business is changing, but it, it is still predominantly uh, male and white. And like many other fields of, with those types of demographics, it's hard to get into the business and also to stay in it too. And so I'm wondering what advice you would both give to young women who are pursuing STEM education or STEM careers or just starting out about how they should approach this kind of career, breaking into it too, but also um, you know, achieving longevity in the career too. Yeah, um, you know, one of the things I've benefited most from in my career is mentorship, um, specifically from Leticia. So it's sort of very nice and full circle for me to be able to speak on a panel like this with her. Not only was she sort of the, you know, mentor helping me navigate my initial start in the commercial space industry. She was also my sponsor to, to Truman and <laughs> joining the Defense Council. So, uh, you know, all, all roads have, have led to Leticia. Um, but I think it's really important. It's like, you know, relying on, on, on folks that you trust and assembling sort of a personal advisory board for yourself, the same way you might assemble one for a business where you are filling strategic gaps that you, you lack, you know, and, and filling in that expertise from people that you trust and who can help guide you in your decision making early in your career. That's been really important for me, both people who were more advanced than myself, like Leticia, and also people who are more junior than me. I've benefited from sort of a 360 view of perspectives, and I lean on them often <laughs> for advice and, and for perspective and guidance um, throughout my career. So that's been incredibly helpful. And then, you know, the other, I guess, couple of quick tactical things uh, that have been really useful for me is like always seeking the impactful work over the glamorous work, like 10 out of 10 times, you know, anchoring on, on the work that keeps the lights on. I like to remind people the social media stuff for me. I did not start with social media. The social media came sort of after I had already put in, you know, some work um, in the industry. And then the other part was designing a reputation that I wanted to be known for and then like putting in the work to make it true. I came from a film background. So traversing over into aerospace and defense was like a non-obvious trajectory for me. So I knew I was never going to be the smartest person in any room that I walked in, but I could absolutely uh, become one of the hardest working or like most reliable ones in, in those rooms. And, you know, trying to identify like, you know, the reputation I wanted to create for myself was something I um, proactively spent a lot of time doing and then just putting in the, the work to make that as true as possible. So that's sort of how I've approached it and continue to lean on mentorship, never done learning. Uh, thank you, Kelly. By the way, as, as I said, I have said to you in the past, uh, you know, mentorship, sponsorship always requires the person that deserves that. And you're the one who really, uh, you know, with your grit and the way you've been pursuing uh, your career, uh, have really, you know, made happen what is happening to you now and, and this great opportunity of space flight that opens for you that I know is deeply meaningful to you. Uh, I think, in fact, Kelly is an example of someone that is following uh, what it's a Japanese term, uh, some of you may be familiar with called igikai. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's sort of the intersection of what you're good at, what this, what the world needs, uh, what uh, you love and what society will want to pay you for. And that's sort of where, you know, your career sort of should be because other things can end up being a passion, but not really a career path or that they, they'll become a job, but they won't become what you're passionate to wake up for every day. And so I think uh, anyone who can kind of map for themselves, what is it that is at this intersection uh, is, it will be headed in the right direction. 
But as far as advice, I think, uh, I guess what I would want to say is that uh, it's a long, long journey and uh, it will never work out the way you, you had mapped it out. So it never does. And I think being fluid and flexible with what, what the opportunities are to continue to stay engaged, even if it's not the way you had envisioned, is really important. Uh, I mean, nothing is an overnight success. You look at people like, you know, Pam Melroy, who is deputy NASA administrator, and it's fantastic to have a woman in that role. You know, she went to Australia to help them start their space agency before she, she made such big move in her career to go and grab more experience. Uh, you know, she worked when I got to know her was uh, when I was at Escape Dynamics and she was uh, uh, leading a TTO at DARPA, uh, sort of innovating on, you know, the new ways of war fighting. Uh, she, she is such, and she worked at Lockheed in the industry. Uh, she worked in the FAA in the commercial office. So it's sort of a very uh, full background where I think all, all those experiences are coming to bear in the new role she has. Um, I mean, not really the war fighting part <laughs> for, for NASA, but, but the point is she's someone who thinks strategically about, you know, uh, what an innovation roadmap should look like and, and how you can work between private and public to really uh, advance innovation. And so I think, you know, whatever, just find ways to continue to show your talent because you can't also, a lot of people, and to, unless you're vocal about it and you keep being engaged, uh, you can be great, but no one will know. And so uh, Kelly is great at that. I'm really bad at this. I tend to be more discreet and quiet and I'm learning from her. So uh, but, uh, yeah, that would be my advice. That I didn't know that, uh, Leticia, you were a mentor to Kelly. I feel like I'm third wheeling here, but I'm glad for the, <laughs> for the opportunity. Um, so I'd like to move on next to some questions from um, people watching. Um, we have some questions that were submitted before the panel. And if you have a question right now, please feel free to use the Q&A function on Zoom and we will queue it up. Um, so first question for, for Kelly, how do you mentally prepare to go to space? When I think about the prospect of actually going, it feels beyond overwhelming. And from one mother to another, I would love to hear what the conversation was like when you told your daughter you were going. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I think it's important to, you know, understand from the start that, you know, I approach this with just like unbridled enthusiasm. Like this is a, a dream for me. It's something I'm passionate about, and not just for myself, but for the next generation of, you know, people who are going to benefit from the increased access to human spaceflight and, and from the technology maturation cycles that are going to be reduced by cheaper access to space. Um, and so for me, it's like mental preparation. You know, I feel like I, I've, I've been ready, born ready kind of thing from that perspective. On the other side of preparation and sort of training, I like to joke that I'm upping my dose of vitamin G, which is, you know, I'll, I have to carefully choreograph all my movements in the cabin in space. And so I'll be practicing that choreography here on earth on a series of microgravity flights and also like aerobatic high G flights to prepare and to make sure all of my experiments are working exactly the way I need them to um, when I when I go to space. So that'll help me figure out ideal sensor placement for some of the wearable technology that I'll be wearing and just validate the choreography like practice makes perfect. And then because it's a dedicated research mission, my flight will also involve um, additional training and operational and safety protocols that differ from a tourist flight. So I am pumped for astronaut training to, <laughs> to put it simply. And then on my daughter, um, you know, it's great because she's so young. It's just everything that, that she sort of, um, you know, interprets is kind of like for the first time, she's three years old. Her name is Delta V, which is a very nerdy space reference. Actually, Leticia has a dog named Delta V as well. So we, we just have lots in common. Um, but yeah, her, her reaction has been one of like wonderful curiosity, which is so great for me to see. Like I mentioned earlier, her framework is like, oh yeah, moms go to space. And I think the other part that's cool is like, oh, and, and moms have other jobs too. It's like the, she, 
at, at a way that a three-year-old can like is beginning to understand the concept of multitudes <laughs> and that you can be more than one thing and it's not just like you know a, an astronaut is not a monolith the same way like a mother is not a monolith and the same way like you know an entrepreneur is not a monolith and so I think that has been the most rewarding part um, so she's she's pumped. She got to go. She was one of the very first people to give Sir Richard Branson a little fist bump when he came back to Earth from his space flight. So she's like embraced the spectacle of human space flight. She's seen the spaceship. They took us on such a, a sweet tour that uh, that I'll be flying in. So she um, she's ready. And my husband has been hearing me talk about this for for years. So his reaction was more of a finally, like we can move past this as a family um, versus one of like surprise. So yeah, I, I've had the benefit of a lot of support and I'm, I'm really excited for the opportunity. And, and I take the responsibility quite seriously to make sure that in going, I hold that door open for the next generation of scientists, astronauts and, and payload specialists and researchers who are going to follow. That's great. Um, we have a question for Leticia. Uh, women like yourself have made exceptional strides in the field, but the reality is the space and tech industry in many ways is still an old boys club. Do you think it is changing and what needs to be done to make the space industry a more diverse, open and inclusive field? Well, uh, lots to unpack because, uh, yeah, I mean, progress is being made, but it's extremely slow. Uh, I was realizing that, you know, 10 years ago, I was on a, on a panel talking about how little funding women were getting in the finance industry. And, and now we're hearing, you know, in the VC industry and, and, and as women entrepreneurs, I mean, the numbers are still very low. Uh, at the same time, there are more and more successes. So I think we really have to uh, shine a spotlight on the successes because it shows it's possible, right? Uh, uh, and so let's pay attention to all those successes, people like Kelly, you know, uh, on the space that, that is really being um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, taking that mission on her and sort of deliberate about it. Uh, if we get back on this inspiration for mission and, and women in space as astronaut, which is not my past, but I want to get back to it for a second because it's interesting to reflect on the fact that it took 15 years to go from the first female private astronaut and Nushan Sari to get to the second and third uh, private orbital female astronaut, uh, which just went Heli Arsenault and Dr. Sian Proctor. Uh, so that's a long period, and it's more than this. Uh, and, and, and what I mean by that is that Every other private astronaut who's gone to space were deliberate in their approach. They actually decided they wanted to go. They made their they made their flight plan. They sat down with you know. Uh, oftentimes it was uh, people in Russia because they were going on the Soyuz. But they essentially were very deliberate about it. Uh, Anusha was a backup flyer for someone else who ended up not flying. And so within weeks of her space flight, she got a call saying, "Hey, how about you go instead?" And she's like, of course, it's my dream. I've always wanted it. I'll go. And and Heli Arsenault, uh, for those of you who watch the Netflix documentary, which is amazing, that follows uh, them on their journey, I really advise it. I think it's called Inspiration Four or something like this. Uh, she also received that call. You know, it was Sanjud who had to talk to her about a, an amazing opportunity, and uh, and that was that, and, and that was an invitation to fly. And and Sian Proctor, we know, won this competition. So. My point is women still have to be invited. Uh, and in fact, so let me actually give a kudos here and a thank you, it's my turn, uh, to uh, Brendan Doherty, who is a Truman member. I don't know if he's on the call, but he's the one who invited me to join the Truman community. And I said that because women still need to be invited at the table. Uh, and sometimes it's gonna be by other women, sometimes it's gonna be by men, but we all have a role to uh, land our hand and make sure we're inclusive and we bring others wherever we are, when we serve on a board, you know, let's, let's go around the room and see who's missing, who's not at the table, who can I bring in? So I think it's, it's just, uh, we can all make a difference in a small way. And then, you know, making a difference in a bigger way, sure, that's possible. If, if you are at Goldman Sachs and, uh, you know, uh, they, they have done tons of amazing initiative, but how about they start a $1 billion fund backing women entrepreneurs? about that for a change that would make a real difference since you know because that would be sizable scalable investment that would really allow 
a lot of women to, to, to scale their business. And, and I think we'll see that type of, of efforts also happen. So whoever is in this situation, think about what can you do where I am that would allow just one person or impact at scale in a bigger way. They're, they're both important. So we have a question in the Q&A chat and it's, it's a fun one. Um, have your dreams during sleep, not like professional dreams, changed in any way since your formal entry into the space profession? From Anna Duran. Um, no, I can't say that they have. Um, <laughs> it's a hilarious question. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. I mean, now I'm trying to be introspective and honest with myself. Um, my sleep is like generally so fractured. I'm lucky if I can hit like deep sleep and then stay in REM cycles long enough to have a dream that's memorable. So I think um, no is the honest answer. They haven't changed, but you know, my, uh, my sort of like daydreams have definitely like clarified now knowing that this is, a, you know, the belief before my announcement of my flight has always been like, this is a when, not an if, not because I thought that I was particularly extraordinary or deserving, but because I thought the industry was moving in this direction that was going to allow increased opportunity for civilians and for people who are very like, you know, mission driven to help open the space and take advantage of that. Do you think you'll have stress dreams as you get closer to your Virgin Galactic flight? <laughs> Honestly, I think my stress dreams would be like more along the lines of like flight delays or, you know, postponement rather than like stress dreams um, before. I think I would be able to, you know, sleep hopefully well the night before, eat a big breakfast day of and <laughs> hopefully be ready to rock. But, you know, we'll see. Yeah, no, no change in my, uh, <laughs> in my dreams. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm just, I'm imagining, you know, the night before a space flight, you have a dream that you forget your spacesuit or something. <laughs> it's like the same type of dreams where, you know, I didn't study for the exam and it's tomorrow. Um, totally. Well, I, I think that's a good spot for us to, to end on. Kelly and Leticia, Leticia, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Thank you, Marina. It Thanks, great. Marina. And thanks for also being, uh, you know, sort of doing your part to get, you know, space to be better understood by people through your writing and, and all you do on your end. Thank you. Yeah, I'm more of a, Leticia, you said earlier, you're an enabler um, and, and Kelly is the, the astronaut. I'm the scribe. I'm just here to watch the show and, and tell people about it. Um, so thank you again for this great chat and thank you to the Truman Center for having us here today. And of course, thank you to everyone watching. Thank you. Thanks.